So Hobbes still lives within a, a Christian perspective, not because he was Christian or the world was Christian, right? It, it's just as I explained, and I'm not going to go over it again. There is a change from a, an idea of the of the of the whole as all as all being one and part of the same order, and the separation between a, you know what you know what's called a God as origin and end, perfectly good perfect being and a broken world. And that's a very important separation because it's a distinction that allows an Augustine to say that you know there is a city of God and an, uh, the after, an afterlife that is, is perfectly good or perfectly evil depending on your choice here. But this separation which is an advance compared to this is also a, a problem. Right? It's an advance because, for example, it creates the idea of the seculum, right? Of this world, this time, our age. It also uh, removes the so quote unquote enchantment, the magic, in the, in the in not a good sense, from the world. Just to very briefly explain what I mean, in the ancient, ancient, ancient uh, world, pre-Christian, pre-Judeo-Christian, not only the Greeks, the Egyptians, uh, Mesopotamians, the world, you know, everything is one. So the physical world, the trees, the, everything there is, is imbued with meaning and forces that you can't control. And, you know, this is why you have the, the, the stories, the myths of the legends uh, of the, you know, the nymph who lives, who lives in the tree, right? Uh, in the forest, in the tree, embodies something, right? It, now we have New Age, which is similar. It's sort of a regression to the same idea of, you know, everything there is is imbued with magic and whatever. But this is very different this thing from this sort of a Judeo-Christian perspective, because there's no, m there's plenty of meaning, but there's no magic. There's nothing to be afraid of in this world. That's the, the point in this, because there's a separation of the divine from the what? from the temporal. But this separation from, of the divine from the temporal, which is an advance in the sense of the fact that, for example, it allows us to do what? It allows us to, this is what allows for science to exist, so in, the, in the modern sense. The, the, in the sense that I can take a frog and dissect it and make experiments and I'm not afraid that the frog god is going to jump at my throat. Right? Because there's a separation of the divine and of, of the created from the creator. But this distinction also creates the possibility of rupture. Not rapture, but rupture, of, of breaking apart. Meaning that this becomes so remote, as you saw in Pakeway, that simply is the divine, the, the meaning, fullness, because that's what we mean, right? Order, the source of order. Is because of this distinction in our minds it becomes impossible, it becomes neglected. And what are we left with then? We're only left with a material world. We're only left with a material world. Is there then meaning? What is the source of meaning in this material world? Well, let's see what Hobbes says. Let's see what Hobbes says. But, and it was important that, I, that we have this, this context because it will give you a clue to why Hobbes says what he says. For, so what is, you know, Hobbes' conception of a human being? Because it always starts from that. You can't say it, have any political idea unless you have an idea of what is good for the human being or bad, or what is profitable or not profitable. No matter how, what words you use, it's, that's, that's the story, right? You set up a program because you know where you're going to go. So for Hobbes, what are human beings? Well, human beings are simply just matter. They're simply just material. Which means, so how about thoughts? How about good and evil? How about whatever? What guides us, right? What is meaning? Perhaps because this is what happens. It's, this part has been erased. It's all matter. Perhaps our, what we call good and evil, is only reaction that we have as matter. Everything we know, our mind, which is also just, just matter, is a response to literally 
action of the environment on us. So if something punches us, the, le the brain learns that it's bad. If something caresses us, the brain learns that it's good. And that's all the brain does. The brain doesn't have any other capacity but to kind of ex gather these experiences and put them together. And thus make sense. That's all there is. We are just these objects onto which different forces from the uh, environment bump into. And our collection of experiences from this bumping into <laughs> is what our thoughts are, and what our ideas are, and what our programs are, and what our ideals are, and whatever. So basically, the human, be uh, human beings are dri driven by only two things. Fear, right, those, of those things that hurt. Fear, repulsion, aversion, and we call it evil. Or desire. Desire love, appetite for those things that we find, that we enjoy, right? that are not harmful. So fear or attraction, that's all there is. These are the two things that we give them all kinds of names according to Hobbes. But these are the good things. So basically the good is what then? The good, right? What is the good life, the best life? But the good is simply pleasure. And the evil is what? Pain. That's all there is. Because we're only matter objects to things bumping into us. So how about then virtue, virtuous action? What about it? I mean, clearly, we, there can be no talk about this. Okay, how about happiness, which from Plato on, right, is the goal of all human beings. Well, that's the next clear. It cannot be completely achieved here because it's broken, but we have a clear and whatever. So how about happiness? What would be happiness if we are only guided by two things, Aver aversion, evil, suffering, pain, desire, pleasure, appetite. Clearly, one of them is preferable, right, by the, this human being made of only of matter, and that's what? Pleasure. So what is happiness then, according to this idea of a human being, is the continued, uninterrupted, unimpeded, un, uh, uh, without obstacles, right, unimpeded pursuit of pleasure. Happiness is a continued pursuit of pleasure. But what do you need in order to pursue this pleasure? And Hobbes says, in the first place, I put a general inclination of all mankind for a perpetual and restless desire of what? Power after power. So, in the first place, I put for a general inclination of all mankind. What is this general inclination of all mankind? A perpetual, restless desire for power. After power, after power, after power. That stops, that ceases only in death. Why power? Because what is power? We talked about this in Machiavelli. You see the parallel. What was the prince searching for? Power. Why was he searching for power? Because he wanted to control Fortuna. That's what power was. It was you know, his ability to survive, his virtu, with which he survived Fortuna. Now, in Hobbes, what is this power? This power is the capacity of not being stopped or stopping everyone else from stopping you in your pursuit of pleasure. Because you're only driven by these things. You either run away scared, screaming, or you're, you're driven to, for, to, for, to satisfaction. And since one is good, one the other one isn't, right? We call it good and evil, right? according to Hobbes, then power will be that capacity of not be stopped in your pursuit for pleasure, which is happiness. And that's the human being. Now, if this, these are the human beings, and there are many other things, of course, but that, let's just start from here. Now, let's move to the other key concept in Hobbes and, and Locke, the famous contractualists, or contractualist um, political thinkers, which is there that they both start from this idea of a quote-unquote state of nature. Now, notice that this is not natural law, or the law of nature, right? Natural laws in Aquinas, or the law of nature as in, uh, you know, uh, uh, Aristotle, even, even Plato. No, this is the state of nature. So, this is obviously an imaginary setup in which they try to project, it's the same question, what is, what is the human being? In order to ask what is the human being and what is the nature of society, since society is something we have organized, constructed, 
right? Seems like that. So it's not, is it natural, right? Um, since it's something that we have constructed, in order to ask what is the good society, you have to ask about its origins. Where does society come from? In order to ask for origins, you have to ask what was before society, right? And, and this is the mental thing. Even if it never existed, that state, right? Uh, and some would argue it can, cannot exist because man is what? Human being is what? A social animal. See, Aristotle, you see, Aquinas, there's no such thing as a man not being a social animal. But that's a different story, right? This is Hobbes. So in Hobbes' law, a state of nature is a projection, is a mental imagination of how would the world look like with human beings without society? How would they interact without society, meaning without a political society, meaning without laws and rules and govern, governorship, uh, uh, governance, someone to govern them? Hmm? How would this look? That's the state of nature. But let's picture the state of nature according to Hobbes. Here are all these individuals. Okay, that's all there is. No shape. I erase this shape. It's just a bunch of. If, it's, if it looks familiar, you understand why we're talking about this philosophy in modernity, right? Because we have this idea that we are individuals. Now, this for an Aristotle and Aquinas would be an abomination, right? And we talked about feral children and so on, children who were raised by wolves, wolves or whatever. So, you know, nobody is born an island, would say Aquinas, uh, Aristotle, because biologically you can't. But, state of nature, atoms, islands, sounds like suburbia. Um, so, all these atoms and islands, well, individuals, this is the state of nature. So how, how would be life in this situation? Well, first of all, let's ask again, how does each individual behave? Well, looks familiar perhaps, you know, when you think of Machiavelli. What do individuals want? Satisfaction. What is that? Selfishness, right? We call it selfishness, meaning it's self-satisfaction. Desire, satisfaction, that's the good that individuals pursue. Now, the one thing that all these people have in common, although they're of different shapes, they have basically the same human nature, but they also, there's one major thing that everybody has. That is the desire, the, the most basic desire, the most basic, you know, impulse, which is that of self-preservation, life, preserving life, self-preservation. Right? So everybody has that, right? But otherwise, they're driven by what? Selfishness? A drive for power, meaning stopping everyone else from you receiving satisfaction. Now, what is the world is limited in resources, right? So how will this world look? Well, it will look as a, as a world in which each of these individuals are vying for power, meaning for pushing everyone else aside in order to get their continued drive of what we call good, which is actually satisfaction. That is the state of nature. So let's, let's look at how, how, um, how, how Hobbes actually uh, calls the state of, state of nature. And actually, you have a, a, a lengthy uh, a quote in, uh, on Canvas, right? on, uh, on, uh, online, where you, can, uh, where you can read it in more detail. But I'm just going to read a few uh, paragraphs here sentences. So, this is, a, this is a time with no government, no nothing. This is a time in which they all compete with each other. This is a time when they all fight with each other. This is a time of unceasing war. The, the state of nature, according to Hobbes, is a state of war. A state of nature without law and governance is a state of continued conflict of war. During the time men that men live without a common power to keep them all in awe, so without a government, they are all in a condition which is called, says Hobbes, war. And such a war as is of every man against every man. The state of nature, the original state, according to our nature, right, is a state of continued war. Yes. Because all men are selfish and all men, all human beings, pursue what? their own desires. And they're not free unless they can push aside all the others. Right? Sounds familiar again, there's a reason why. So, the nature of war doesn't mean that necessarily it's fighting, but it's the disposition 
It's the disposition of continued conflict with no ceasing, with no rest. Because there's nothing to stop it. That's the problem with the state of nature. There's nothing to stop this continued conflict and fight once, like one against the other, because the only thing that drives us, no ideas, no ideals, no noble, nobility, no whatever, morals, what morals? There's no morals. We are just a bunch, bunch of matter that pursue what doesn't cause us pain. That's what we are. No ideas, mod uh, moralism. So how does this, if this would be a real place, how would this be look? How, how would this look? In such a condition, there is no place for industry. Nothing would be built. Because the fruit thereof is uncertain. You don't have time because he's running at you with a big stick, right? And consequently, no culture of the earth. No agriculture that needs time for that, right? You, put, you build something, he comes and takes it from you. No navigation or use of the commodities that may be imported by sea. No commodious building. When would you build? No instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force. No development of tools. No knowledge of the face of the earth. To accumulate knowledge, you need what? Leisure. Remember from Aristotle. No account of time. No arts. No letters. It's basically survival. Worst of all, he says, continual fear and danger of violent death. This is a time of continuous fear and danger of violent death, every moment, any, any time, any second. How does the life of man look then in the state of nature? It's solitary, there's no friendship, right? It's poor, nothing. It's nasty, it's brutish and short. The famous sentence, the life of man, solitary, brute, poor, nasty, brutish and short. Nasty, brutish and short. That's the state of nature. So what do we do now? I mean, how, 